Pranams and loving greetings to all of you. It's a joy to have you with us again today as we continue celebrating the 100th anniversary of Paramahansa Yogananda's arrival in America and of his bringing the Self-Realization Fellowship teachings to us. Today we're also commemorating the 70th anniversary of that first convocation that Paramahansa Ji held here at the Mother Center. That convocation began on August 13th, 1950. I'm Sister Draupadi, and the title of our talk today is The Guru, Speaking Voice of Silent God, which is a description that Paramahansa Ji shared with us in a beautiful prayer to his own Guru. He also said, through the Guru, God the Silent, talks openly. For those of you who are disciples of Paramahansa Ji, much of which I share today will be familiar to you. For those of you who are new to the Self-Realization Fellowship teachings and the concept of the Guru-Disciple relationship, we hope to give you a glimpse. And I say that because this is a vast subject. So we hope to give you a glimpse of the role that the Guru plays in the disciple's life and the spiritual practices and blessings that he gives to us to help us on our soul's journey back to God. Brother Chirananda-ji expressed it so beautifully when he said, through the Guru and his teachings, God himself takes our hand to guide us on that journey. So let's hold tight to the hand of the Lord and let us begin. The word guru is so commonly used in the world today that its true meaning has been somewhat diminished. So what does guru really mean? To answer that question, I would like to share a tribute that was given to Paramahansa Ji that so beautifully describes what guru means. The saintly Shankaracharya of Kanchipuram, who was the spiritual head of one of the four monastic branches of India, met Paramahansa Ji in Kolkata in 1935. And he later observed the Guru's activities here in America. And this is what he said. As a bright light shining in the midst of darkness, so was Yogananda Ji's presence in this world. Now, when he referred to Paramahansa Ji as a bright light shining in the midst of darkness, he was describing what the Indian scripture, the Guru Gita, tells us, that the Guru is the dispeller of darkness. We live in a world of delusion that has cast a veil over us so that God, the great reality, is hidden from our souls. And that's why we feel that great separation from Him. The Guru, a liberated master sent by God, removes that dark veil and leads us into the light of God's living, loving presence. The Shankaracharya also said this of Paramahansa Ji, such a great soul comes on earth only rarely when there is a real need among men. And when we look at our world today, I think we'd all agree that humanity is in great need. All of us, no matter where we are, we're having to navigate through the many changes and challenges facing each one of us in our world today. But by stark contrast, the masters tell us that this world has entered an ascending age and that humanity is in the midst of an evolutionary shift in consciousness toward greater spiritual awakening. And that is why Paramahansa Ji came during this ascending age. He was given a special dispensation by his line of God-realized gurus to disseminate to the West and then to the entire world the sacred science of Kriya Yoga meditation, through whose practice you and I can accelerate our soul evolution, 
ride this wave of evolutionary shift in consciousness and attain our soul freedom in God. So Paramahansa Ji came on earth with a two-fold mission. He came as a Jagat Guru, which is a Sanskrit term for world guru or universal guru. He came to awaken the nations to the soul-revealing possibilities of yoga. And he came for us, his disciples, as our Satguru, our true Guru, for one purpose only, not to draw anyone to himself, but to awaken us, to awaken that beautiful soul divinity that is hidden in our heart and consciousness and bring that fully to the fore. The relationship between the guru and disciple is sublime. It's based on love, unconditional love of God and guru. And to have a guru leading us Godward is a rare gift. And for those of us who are disciples of Paramahansa Ji, he is for us a treasure because we simply could not walk the spiritual path without our Guru. However, to truly understand the beauty and the blessing of that relationship, one has to live it. One has to experience it because it's very, very personal. Sri Dayamataji, who so purely reflected the Guru and his teachings, experienced that relationship. And these are her words. Of all the human beings that I've known in this world, there is one and only one to whom I knew I could always go and bear my soul without the slightest reservation. That was and is my Guru. He radiated so much love to us, which filled the heart with a deep, reassuring sense of security. His love and friendship were and are unconditional. When we hear these early disciples speak so lovingly about being with the Guru, we may think, will it be the same for me now? Can I still have that same kind of relationship that the guru, well, while the guru is not here in his physical form? They had a living guru. Do I need a living guru? This question has been asked so many times by so many devotees, including myself. As a young seeker, I was one who wanted to have a living guru. And there was a time in my life when I was suddenly drawn to meditation and to reading books on yoga, and to reading translations of some of the Indian scriptures. And in everything that I read, there were two recurring themes that really spoke to me. The first was, learn to meditate. And the second was this statement, when the student is ready, the master appears. And this last promise really spoke to me. It stirred my longing for a guru. And I reasoned that if I looked for the master, he might appear sooner rather than later. So I began my search for a number of months, mostly here on the west coast of California, but nothing resonated. So I made plans to travel to India to search there for a guru who could personally teach me. One afternoon in my own hometown of Fullerton, California, I drove by a little church on a street corner with a marquee that read, A Yogi and His Family. And I thought, they teach yoga here. I'm going to look into this. The service was the next evening. And as I sat in front of the podium, this thought came to me. I wonder how they refer to their speaker. Is he a pastor or a minister or a reverend? When suddenly, to my surprise, out steps this distinguished looking gentleman with long brown hair and a full beard, dressed in an ochre dhoti and kurta, which is the garb of an Indian monk, 
wearing sandals and holding a danda, which is a walking stick. And as I observed the whole situation, I thought, well, a reverend he's not. He was a Swami, and that Swami turned out to be Brother Achalanandaji. And that night, Brother Ji never spoke about a yogi and his family. He talked instead about his recent trip to India with Sri Dayamataji and the pilgrimage that they had made to all of the ashrams of Paramahansa Yogananda. And he spoke of the Master. And he said, for those of you who are new, read Autobiography of a Yogi. And then he led the congregation in a chant, one of the Guru's chants. Door of my heart, open wide, I keep for thee. And as I sang with the congregation, I felt feelings that I'd never known before. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is it. I found the Master. I found him. That night, I, I purchased Autobiography of a Yogi, and I finished it in two days. And as I flipped the page to the last chapter, my eye fell on the title of the next page, which said, Paramahansa Yogananda, a yogi in life and death. And it was the letter from the director of Forest Lawn Memorial Park testifying to the fact that three weeks after the guru's passing, there was no physical disintegration on his body, that he was in a phenomenal state of immutability. Basically, his body was incorruptible. And as astounding as that statement was, what struck me was, he's gone. He cannot teach me, and I need a living guru. I was d deeply disappointed and somewhat confused because it all seemed so right. But I decided that I'd have to travel to India after all, and I also determined I'd go to the service the next morning. Brother Achalananda was the speaker again. This time he was wearing Western clothing. And after a few introductory remarks, this is what he said. The subject of our service this morning is the ever-living Guru. Those words, the ever-living Guru, resounded in my mind. And frankly, I couldn't tell you a word that Brother G said that morning, but I knew that all my questions had been answered and that the promise that was made in all those yoga books had come true for me. When the student is ready, the master appears. Sometime afterwards, I reflected on what happened and I realized just how well Guruji already knew me. He arranged that beautiful meeting to suit my own temperament and my love of India. And then I realized that my ever-living Guru, the speaking voice of Silent God, was already teaching me. I'm sure that many of you have your own precious memories of how the Guru found you because the ever-living Guru does search for us, not only in this lifetime, but over many incarnations, waiting for that perfect meeting. And Sister Gyanamata, one of Guruji's foremost woman disciples, shared her beautiful perspective on this divine search, which is motivated by pure divine love. Her words read like scripture, the masters, the good shepherds of this world, come down from their high places and give their lives to searching for disciples who are lost in the darkness. They find them in desolate and dangerous places, arouse them, lift them to a divine shoulder, and bear them with rejoicing to a safe place in the fold. They feed them with celestial food and give them living water to drink, of which if a man eat and drink, he shall live 
forever. And listen to this next sentence. They give them the power to become the sons of God. They give their own lives to the last ounce of flesh and the last drop of blood for the redemption of the sheep who know their voice. So beautiful. So now that we've met the Guru, what part does the disciple have to play? To establish a personal relationship with the Guru, it's necessary for us to develop attunement with him. This is at the heart of the Guru-disciple relationship. Attunement makes us receptive to his speaking voice, his blessed communications to our soul. When the Master came to America in those early years and drew those disciples to him, they had the blessing of being in his presence, hearing his voice, receiving his counsel and his training. But those disciples tell us that there was something very unique in the training that Guruji gave them. He would never allow them to become outwardly dependent on his magnetic personality or upon seeing his physical presence or hearing his physical voice. Why? Because whether they were in his physical presence or not, Guruji wanted them to cultivate unbroken attunement with his consciousness so that there would never be any sense of separation whatsoever. He gave that training to Sri Dayamataji. This is what she said. Because of the years of discipline Master gave me, during which he constantly turned my mind from dependence on his outer personality to inner attunement with him, by the grace of God, I have never felt a sense of separation from him since he left his body. So how do we cultivate attunement? There was a disciple who was very devoted to the Master, but he always liked taking photographs of him. He liked looking at the pictures, but he made very little effort to meditate and attune his consciousness. One day, Guruji said to him, Learn to know me in meditation. You will know me much better then. Here's a key for us, because he's saying the same thing to us. The real connection between the guru and disciple takes place on an inner soul level. And when we strive to make that soul contact with the guru in meditation, two things happen. We begin to know him and his nature, and we understand the ways in which he interacts with us. And when we invite him, because we do have to invite him into our lives to guide us. He remains always aware of us. Guruji would say, I go through your soul. I go through your life. I know what you are thinking. So when we make that soul contact with the Guru, we become inwardly receptive to his speaking voice, talking to us through our intuition. Sister Ganamata had such attunement with the Guru, so much so that Guruji guided her mainly through her intuition. Listen to what he said. The more you tune in with me, the more I will be with you in spirit. Sister Ganamata, I talk to by sending thoughts to her through the ether. Many souls I guide that way. As soon as you reach a certain point of development, then you will see I am directing you. When I read this last sentence, it really struck me because when he said, as soon as you reach a certain point of development, you will see I am directing you, that doesn't mean 
He doesn't start directing you until you reach a certain point of development. He's always directing you. But there comes a point when you realize it, when it's real, when you sense him near. Dayamachachi told us that when the Guru was with him, he was like a fountain, continually pouring bliss, peace, and happiness into their hearts. So when Guruji entered Mahasamadhi, when he suddenly left his body, the disciples suffered greatly because they felt they lost their divine guide. But Rajasi Janakananda, who assumed the presidency after Guruji, because of his inner attunement with the Guru during the Guru's lifetime, was able to remain in constant communion with Guruji in his ascended form. And nearing the one-year anniversary of Guruji's passing, the disciples were with Rajasi and Encinitas, and they were meditating with him. And afterwards, Rajasi told them that Master had come to him. And this is what he said. Master is aware of your sorrow, and he asked me to tell you this. I could appear to them now. I have the power to do so. But they would then be content to remain where they are. Rather, they must come to where I am. So beautiful. Guruji conveyed his awareness of the sorrow of the disciples. But when he said they must come to where I am, he was encouraging them to keep striving to reach higher in meditation so they could strengthen and renew their attunement with him. And then their sorrow would begin to fade and dissipate completely. He would say the same thing to us. But how, how do we reach higher? In his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Paramahansaji tells us exactly how to do this. He said, Devotees who go deep in meditation are able to reach higher, reach the higher realms where the great ones dwell. That is the purpose of the scientific techniques for self-realization taught from ancient times in India. And many of you have learned those techniques that Guruji brought, that sacred science of yoga meditation. These practices help the yogi to uplift his consciousness, to receive consciously the subtle vibratory aid of God and liberated masters. So each time we meditate, we're doing the spiritual work of uplifting our vibration higher. I remember once asking our beloved Mirnalini Mar, late president, to confirm my thinking on this, see if it was correct. I said, Mirnalini Ma, it's not only that we are meditating our way back to God, but we are also vibrating our way back to God. Is that right? And she said, she had a beautiful smile. She said, yes, dear, we are. Think about that. And I also remember Mira Mataji, mother of Mirlani Ma, telling us something that really caught my attention. She said that Master's aspiration for his disciples is this. Come and live in my vibration. Guruji explains in his second coming of Christ that a true guru always inwardly coaxes us to reach that high vibration of God consciousness where the guru dwells. And this is paramount. It was the most important aspect of the guru's training of his disciples. And each one of them focused on attuning with him so that they could gradually live in that spiritually refined state of God consciousness where he dwells. And he's asking us to do the same. We're going to go a little deeper here. 
when Christ said of his disciples, they hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He meant that by meditation, his disciples uplifted their consciousness to perceive his voice. What voice is that? The cosmic vibration of Om that would lead them to God. Guruji tells us that the cosmic vibration of Om is the voice of God. And those of you who attended the Tech, the class on the technique of the Om meditation learned about that. But this is really the deeper meaning of the speaking voice of silent God. The Guru coaxes us to tune in with him that we may perceive that divine voice of the Om vibration that will lead us to God. And Guruji has given us that technique that enables us to experience that divine power of God as the Om, also known as the Holy Ghost vibration. Guruji said, I am in the Holy Ghost. I am talking from that sphere. This is where Guruji and the Great Ones dwell, and this is where he wants us to live increasingly and permanently. That's why he said, they must come to where I am. Come and live in my vibration. Of course, each day we're all striving to reach that refined state of divine consciousness to the best of our ability. But sometimes devotees tell us that they struggle just to calm the restless mind. <clears throat> and I think we've all had those days when the mind just doesn't cooperate. And I want to share an approach that is helpful in focusing the mind because sometimes I think we've not prepared the mind sufficiently for meditation. At the very beginning of your meditation, when you invoke the presence of God in the gurus, don't do it absent-mindedly. Take your time. When you invoke the presence of God, begin to visualize a light here at the Kutasta Center, at the point between the eyebrows. And as you use that beautiful prayer that Paramahansaji has given to us, Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, stop when you say, Father, Heavenly Father, Father, my Father. What does the Father mean to you personally? Try to feel that, reflect on that, and stay there, invoking his presence. And if you don't feel an affinity with that aspect of God, then tell him, Father, I want to know you. If you feel more drawn to the mother aspect, mother, my divine mother, feel what the mother means to you, and do that as you say that prayer. Then when you invoke the presence of the gurus, visualize the image of each one of them at the Kutasta Center and feel that you are placing yourself in their presence to meditate with them and feel what each one means to you. Do that and see what happens. Something will happen as you focus on them. You will make a connection. And you will find that that restless mind is now very calm and focused, ready to dive in to the presence of the living God. And after, for example, we've invoked the presence of the Guru, let us not leave him. Remember, He's there meditating with you, guiding your meditation, reinforcing your every effort. Sometimes devotees say, well, if my concentration isn't perfect, God isn't going to come to me or Guru won't help me. I have to be perfect and then they will. Not necessarily. 
Guruji said that God is more willing to give than we are to ask. And if we approach him with a heart full of yearning, he will respond. Guruji said, like any other loving father, he delights, he delights in fulfilling our worthy wishes. I want to share a story with you from Autobiography of a Yogi. When Guruji was a young disciple, he was known as Makunda, and he had gone to his Guru's room planning to meditate, and I want to share his words from Autobiography. He said, My laudable purpose was unshared by my disobedient thoughts. They scattered like birds before the hunter. Makunda, Sri Yukteswar's voice sounded from a distant balcony. Now, try to visualize it. The guru's on a balcony over here and the disciples over in another room and they're just sort of calling out to each other. Makunda, Sri Yukteswarji's voice sounded from a distant balcony. I felt as rebellious as my thoughts. Master always urges me to meditate, I muttered to myself. He should not disturb me when he knows why I came to this room. He summoned me again. I remained obstinately silent. The third time, his tone held rebuke. Sir, I am meditating, I shouted protestingly. I know how you are meditating, my guru called out, with your mind distributed like leaves in a storm. Come here to me. Thwarted and exposed, I made my way sadly to his side and listen to the sweetness and the awesomeness that takes place next. Poor boy, mountains cannot give you what you want. Master spoke caressingly, comfortingly. His calm gaze was unfathomable. Your heart's desire shall be fulfilled. Sri Yukteswar seldom indulged in riddles. I was bewildered. He struck gently on my chest above the heart. And what transpired next was that Sri Yukteswarji imparted to Mukunda Samadhi. He gave him an experience in cosmic consciousness. And you can read that in Autobiography of a Yogi, Chapter 14, My Experience in Cosmic Consciousness. But you see, his, his thoughts were scattered like birds before the hunter. And Guruji helps us too. You know, we may not reach or experience samadhi instantaneously, but even when we struggle with a restless mind, if we persevere, and if you watch for it, there comes a point in your meditation when a shift takes place. And you enter into a deep inner state of peace and calmness. And I'm sure that the majority of you have experienced this not once, but many times. It is the Guru who, reinforcing our own efforts, helps us enter that realm of God Consciousness. Guruji said, When you are meditating and practicing your Kriya regularly with the love of Divine Mother in your heart, remember, I am there with you in spirit. Your joy will increase and the love you feel will grow. This is his promise. Hold him to it while doing your part. All right, so we've talked about meditation as being the most powerful way to attune our consciousness with our Guru. Studying his teachings is another way to develop attunement, and you've had a class on that. When we study his teachings, this is not merely to acquire intellectual knowledge. Certainly, Guruji wants us to study deeply and to absorb and to understand and especially to apply his teachings in our life, 
if we are to draw closer to God. But there's an aspect that I'd like to emphasize. I'm sure that Brother Sarla Nandaji covered this. When we approach our study of the Guru's teachings with deep reverence and receptivity, this automatically places us in the aura of the Master's presence and creates a vibratory exchange between the Guru and the disciple, between us. And I know that many of us, many of you have told us, and we've also experienced this, that when we study the Guru's teachings, especially the new edition of the SRFYSS lessons, we begin to feel a vibratory power washing over our consciousness. This is the Guru's presence and blessing. Wherein he is awakening our, in, awakening our intuition to do what our intellect alone cannot do. And that is to intuitively perceive the divine wisdom that he knows that we need at that time. Let me share an illustration. In Guruji's Second Coming of Christ on his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, this is when Jesus gave that beautiful discourse to his disciples on that mountaintop near the Sea of Galilee. Guruji tells us that of the divine vibratory power and God consciousness that Jesus imparted to his disciples, and this is an excerpt of the Guru's words. During his teaching, <clears throat> Jesus let loose through his voice as well as through his eyes the divine life force and godly vibration to spread over the disciples, making them calmly attuned and magnetized able to receive through their intuitional understanding of the full measure of his wisdom. How beautiful and powerful is that? Jesus imparted to his disciples a portion of his consciousness and his power so that those disciples could absorb the teachings in their very atoms so that after Guru, the, the Guru left, the earth after Jesus departed, those disciples could spread his gospel with great conviction to the nations, even in the midst of the most severe hardships. Our Guru does the same for us. Listen to his promise. When soul talks to soul, when my spirit talks to your spirit, the words that you attentively listen to will establish an inward, silent attunement and communion. Every spark of truth that has gone within remains with you. If you keep in tune, you will find when you need guidance and help, those sparks, like dormant embers, will spring to life and action within you. You will be able to utilize the flame of Guru given wisdom and truth, making your life what it should be. So, we've discussed the two ways that we can establish attunement through meditation and through the study and application of the Guru's teachings. And so, now that we're in tune with the Guru, he can help us in many other ways. And I'll just name a few because it's always the Guru's role to lead us out of cosmic delusion. And there may be times when he makes us aware of certain tendencies that hinder us, that render us unreceptive to his divine help. Now, when we observe those shortcomings, we shouldn't become discouraged, but rather get busy doing the work of overcoming them. For example, sometimes devotees share with us that they struggle with undesirable moods. We're in a mental age now, and this sort of challenge may surface more periodically. These moods arise from samskars, from mental impressions, 
from repeated thoughts and actions of the past. And every thought and action that we repeat creates a chemical reaction in the brain that creates a groove. And if those thoughts and actions that are repeated over and over again are negative, they become entrenched in the brain and they shape us and they often make us behave in ways that go against our normal way of behaving. And when that happens, it takes great effort to dislodge those mental patterns. But the guru works with us to completely eradicate those undesirable grooves. And this is one of the many ways he helps to free us. As a young nun in the ashram, there was a time when I went through one of those moods. And I found myself repeating these thoughts, I'm not making enough effort, I don't have enough self-discipline, I'm very restless, I'm dry, and so on and so forth. And it went on for quite a while and it only made the situation worse. One day I was entertaining these thoughts when suddenly two other thoughts superimposed themselves on my mind so strongly that it's, they're still vivid to this day. And it was almost as though there was a voice that spoke to me that said, that is not your soul talking. Will you continue to listen to it? Now that made an impression and I froze because I knew that those thoughts didn't come from out of nowhere. And yet, how can we know with, when something that we experience is real? I knew because that mood was completely dispelled. And I somehow understood that if I continued to dwell on those negative thoughts, and remain in that mood, it would only sink me deeper into self-pity. And it could even affect, negatively affect my relationships with other people. Next, not only does those thoughts disappear, but I somehow was able, over the next few days, I saw that I was much more positive and I could resume my sadhana with renewed efforts to improve. So we see here that that message not only spoke to me, but there was a blessing there because I changed. And that's how you can know if it's a true experience. And my point for sharing this story is that our compassionate guru often intercedes to do for us what we cannot sometimes do for ourselves. Sri Mrinalini Mata shared with us Guruji's guidance on this point. She said, The Paramahansaji saw our flaws and candidly pointed them out to receptive devotees. He never dwelled upon those faults. He concentrated primarily on each one's good qualities. He would say, introspect to understand the nature of your shortcomings and its cause and effect. Then dismiss it from the mind. Don't dwell on the flaw. Concentrate instead on cultivating or expressing the opposite good quality. Here's another aspect where the Guru sometimes places us in situations where we must extend beyond our capabilities and beyond what we believe we can do. He stretches us, in other words. And we monastics in the ashram often find ourselves in such situations, and I'm sure you do too. But he does this to help us drop our human limitations and bring forth our soul potential. Daya Mataji said, anything Guruji put his mind to, he could accomplish. He had tremendous mind power. He used to say to us, in my vocabulary, there is no such words as I can't. Thus he instilled in us the consciousness of infinite potentialities. Some years back, our beloved Mrinalini Ma assigned a group of uh, four monastics to work on a project involving architectural plans. And she asked us to report back to her periodically. And even though I was one of the more senior uh, members of that group, the others had 
years of experience, and one of, them, one of them even had architectural training, whereas I had none whatsoever. So periodically in the beginning, I had serious doubts about how much of a contribution I was going to be able to make. Now please remember the word doubts. So the time came for us to present our report, our first report to Mrinal and Ima, and the other nun and I were doing our part to prepare the report. We were trying to be as thorough as possible because Mrinal and Ima's mind was so keen that she, inevitably she always raised an issue that nobody thought of. So we were feeling a little bit tentative and we were saying to each other, we're really going to need Guruji's help here. And there's a beautiful promise in the Gita that Lord Krishna makes that has always been close to my heart. He said, to those who meditate on me as their very own, ever united to me by incessant worship, I supply their deficiencies and make permanent their gain. And I shared this with the other nun, and she said, oh, that's perfect. Let's pray that. So we decided this would be our mantra, but we shortened it to, Oh Lord, please supply our deficiencies. Please supply our deficiencies. And each one of us took turns saying the prayer and the other one would join in. When the time came for us to report to Mrinal and Ima, thankfully, everything went smoothly. And afterwards, Mrinal and Ima spoke so lovingly and so encouragingly to us, and this is what she said. Always remember, whenever you have doubts, stay in tune with God and Guru, and you will see. They will supply your deficiencies, as Lord Krishna promised. To this day, I have no words to tell you how I felt at that moment. But not only does the Lord fulfill His promises, but by such sweet signs, <laughs> the Guru lets us know that He's aware of our doubts, our trepidations, whatever the case may be. And with His blessing, we also come to realize that we can tap in to that creative, infinite potential that's already within our souls. And sometimes we find that there's this presence in the midst of working on a project. You feel this presence that overcomes you. It's as if there's this unseen hand guiding your every thought, your every action. And within the soul quietly says, this is good, this is right. Sometimes devotees share with us that they feel they've not made as much spiritual progress as they would like. And while it may be natural to think that way at times, the truth is it's impossible to measure our spiritual progress because it's very subtle and gradual. And in addition, the abundant help that our Guru gives to us, that cannot be measured. And we're making far more spiritual progress than we can realize with His help. And lastly, how can we even begin to measure the grace of God that descends out of His unconditional love for us? Rather, our focus should be on doing our best to follow our Guru, faithfully and trusting that He will lead us safely and swiftly to God. I'd like to share one last story that takes place in India. It's a very sweet and simple story, but I believe that it illustrates, it illustrates this point. There was a young man who went to a great saint and asked him to be accepted as his disciple, and the Guru accepted him, and he assigned the young Brahmin the duty of gathering wood from the local village for the ashram kitchen. And the disciple performed this duty 
with great nishta, one-pointed steadfastness, day after day, never mindful of how the time was passing. One day as he dropped a pile of wood onto the ashram compound, his Brahmin's tuft got caught between two logs and it was pulled out. And it was the first time since he had entered the ashram that he really noticed his hair. And he was amazed to find that it had turned pure white. And the disciple was aghast to suddenly realize that with the passing of the years, he had changed from a young man to an old man. All this time he thought, I have done nothing but haul wood for my guru. I have learned none of the truths of which I came in search. I have attained to none of those high states of consciousness for which I so deeply longed. All I thought about is the wood which my guru asked me to bring. So thinking, he began to shed bitter tears. At that moment, his guru came hurrying out of the house and hastily put his hands out to catch the teardrops. You great soul, the guru cried with warm emotion. Don't you know that if the tears of sorrow from such a one as you were to touch the ground, the people in this entire countryside would suffer famine and disaster for years to come. Dear one, why are you weeping? Do you not yet realize what you have attained by all these years of single-minded service? So saying, he touched the disciple, who in an instant entered Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the highest ecstasy of God. All knowledge, all wisdom, all love and bliss were his. We see in this story how the heart of this beautiful disciple was filled with pure Guru Bhakti, devotion to the Guru. He was steadfast and selfless in his Guru Seva, lovingly serving the Guru. And following faithfully his Guru given sadhana all those years without measuring, without realizing it, he became absolutely pure, untainted by any sense of ego consciousness. And because there was nothing impeding the divine from flowing into him, the Guru could impart Nirbhikalpa Samadhi to his beautiful disciple. The Guru the true Guru knows exactly what we need to reach salvation. He sees the whole spectrum of our life, our past incarnations, our samskars, our mental impressions. And we can trust that he knows exactly how to help us navigate through our karma, even removing some of that karma from us. And he chooses for each one of us that unique sadhana that will take us most quickly to God. What he gives is tailor-made for us. If we trust and follow, we too will see one day, without even realizing it, how far we've already traveled on the spiritual path. And we see this same beautiful spirit of discipleship in so many of you, faithful to your meditations and your sadhana, giving tirelessly and selflessly to the Guru and to his worldwide spiritual family in so many ways. You spread the Guru spirit more than you can ever realize. And we honor you for following faithfully in the footsteps of our beloved Guru. 
In closing, I'd like to share these words of Sri Dayamataji. Paramahansaji joins the conclave of divine souls who lived on earth as incarnations of light, of the light of truth, to illumine the pathways of mankind. The world must sooner or later turn toward that light. There is a better tomorrow just waiting for mankind to open its eyes and see the dawn. Paramahansa Yogananda and others who have reflected the divine brilliance are the light bearers of that new day. By humbly following our Guru, we are helping that mission of our Gurus who are the light bearers of that new day as they usher in an evolutionary shift in our consciousness and on our beautiful planet. Let us remember this powerful promise of our Guru. He who follows a God-sent Guru walks in the everlasting light of God. So now I would like to invite you to pray with me a beautiful prayer to our divine Gurudev. O light of my life, thou didst spread wisdom's glow over my soul path. Centuries of darkness vanished before the luminous shafts of thy help. O Guru, thou didst lift me out of the land of bewilderment into the paradise of peace. My slumber of sorrow is ended and I am awake in joy. O immortal teacher, I bow to thee as the speaking voice of silent God. I bow to thee as the divine door leading to the temple of salvation. Divine Guru Dev, I lay the flowers of my devotion gently at thy feet. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Amen.